Hi, I'm Peter, and this is Go Verb Noun. Hello and welcome to part two of my interview with Emily Grassley. If you haven't seen the first part yet, I highly recommend clicking my face or really anywhere on the screen. In that first part, she talks to us about what it means to be a chief curiosity correspondent, as well as the topic of science communicators in general. And now, if you're ready for part two, here we go. She's going to talk to us a little bit about the Brain Scoop, her channel, as well as some things about YouTube and being in the media. So, let's check it out. How did you get involved in the Brain Scoop? It was kind of like a it was kind of like a long time coming meets fortuitous series of events, in that um, I had been writing and recording and uh, recording like the day to day activities of what I was doing as a volunteer at the University of Montana Zoological Museum, um, really just trying to kind of promote the work that we were doing and show people what goes on behind the scenes at a small natural history museum, and I got. Actually, a message from our curator one day saying, like, this guy who says he's from Vlog Brothers wants to come and, like, film something for some YouTube thing. And I was like, Hank from Vlog Brothers wants to come and record something here? And he was like, yeah, do you think this is worth our time? And I said, absolutely, lutely it is. Um, so, so Hank uh, came in and he was filming a segment for crash course about the vertebrate skeleton and he wanted to use kind of the museum as a backdrop and use some of our specimens in the in the episode and that's something I was totally I was all about I really like to accommodate artists and creators and educators to use our facilities because that's why we existed as a natural history museum so Hank came and I helped them with the shoot and I gave him a, a tour and um, there was a time when like Nick Jenkins was actually the one who was recording that day and I took Hank around to the lab and showed him some stuff and just kept talking and talking and talking about the importance of this museum and look at this cool thing and oh we have a diaphanized specimen and this is what that means and you know check out this giraffe and we have a rhinoceros and do you know what a baculum is oh my god it's a penis bone it's like a foot and a half long and and then Hank, Hank I think he was endeared by it and he asked me kind of like what are you doing and like I can be a little bit, you know, sneaky. I'm like, well, you know, I'm just a volunteer and we're trying to get all this publicity. And if you could like give us a shout out on your blog, that'd be great. Um, so he did. And he said at one point, like, I'd love to work with you sometime. Like maybe you could come in and work for us on Crash Course or SciShow. And I said, I'd love to. And then I didn't really hear anything from him for a couple months. They were obviously busy doing their own thing. And then I guess it was like November of 2012. Michael Gardner emailed me to ask if Hank could come back and film something. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, so he came with Michael Aranda, and I thought it was for another crash course thing. And then I asked Michael Aranda if he wanted to have a tour of the collection space before we got started working with Hank. And Hank was like, no, 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 we're going to wait to start the tour until we've got a mic on. And I was like, wait. I'm giving a tour and I'm being recorded? Like, I was not anticipating being on camera. But I, it's a tour that I've given many times before, so I gave him a tour, and he edited it, and it was a Vlogbrothers Thoughts from Places video, and I, to this day, it's like one of my favorite videos, um, because I was so excited just to show him around, and then I think it was like Monday, I went up on a Friday, and on Monday, Hank had emailed me being like, hey, so do you like this YouTube thing? Are you interested in hosting your own channel? And I was like, I'm so un inexperienced, I have no idea what I'm doing, um, I'd love to. Like, let's do this. So that's kind of how we got started. Uh, Michael Aranda was a producer for Hank and still is. Um, and so Michael came in and I think he was only originally supposed to help me like learn how to use the camera that uh, Hank had got for the show. And instead ended up recording the entire thing and editing everything and yeah. So that's how we got started. We launched in January of 2013. What's surprising about YouTube as a medium it's learn surprises every day about using YouTube. One, it's a little, it's like unprecedented. You know, it's brand new media. Um, I think one thing that surprised me was how informal it can be and is, and how like low production a show can be while still being incredibly successful. It kind of turned everything I would have thought and assumed about media and educational video like on its head. You think about any kind of like channel or production company or network making educational video or film, even like, you know, PBS has dozens of people who will work on a program and there are creators and, 
you know, it's this, this very long process, but with YouTube, you can spend an hour or two doing research on a topic, you can spend an hour or two writing a script, and you can spend an hour or two filming and editing something, and in a day's work, you can bring something new in an easy to digest and uh, translatable format to an incredibly large number of people. It's amazing. So that kind of surprised me about starting YouTube and doing educational videos was that in one sense, it's very easy. It's very easy in that way. It has all different other kinds of challenges, but um, putting your mind to doing something and creating a final product, like that's easy. It, the difficult part is like improving on that <laughs> and like learning what to look out for, um, to make your videos better, to become a better editor. Like those are the difficult parts, but actually like getting information online was, was simple. And that was really fun to learn. Complete the sentence. Oh man, I can't wait to go to work so that I can... Cut up dead animals with Anna Goldman! And dissect birds in the bird lab! I mean, those are the selfish things. Those are a lot of the stuff that I do. You know, I don't carry a camera around with me everywhere. I'm not recording what happens day to day. It's not a reality TV show. You know, I don't have somebody recording my every move. Um, which we've thought about, like, how interesting would that be to Emily, like, a day in the life? But honestly, guys, I spend, like, four hours a day answering emails. It's not that exciting. But I think the most gratifying part of my job is the interactions that I have with the public and with fans of The Brain Scoop and with audience members. And um, I get even a little bit teary just thinking about it because I, I'm, so, I'm so privileged in that way. Like, I can hardly think of anybody else who has a job like this where they don't get that kind of gratification and, you know, love and support from total strangers for the work that they do. Like, that, there's nothing better in the world. Like, I'm working a job, and it's not just a job for me, it's a job for all these other people. Like, I feel like I'm sharing my life and my job and my work with, with anybody who's willing to come in and watch and, like, and they celebrate my victories with me and anytime like I was in Cosmopolitan last week and like that's amazing Cosmopolitan posted a picture of Dermestid beetles for the, probably the first time in their history of ever and like that's a cool thing and people my audience and and people who are interested in that are like you know smart and and uh they they just they get how cool that is and they're very proud of me and that that like that's the best feeling ever it's it's irreplaceable just just yesterday uh somebody tweeted a picture of me of their daughter and her friend who are at art camp this year and it was dress up like your favorite hero day and one of them dressed up like me and like you just think about all of like the superheroes that exist in the world and everything like in popular media pop culture and like the fact that this girl wanted to dress up like Emily Grassley from the brain scoop is like like it's 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 amazing like there's no there's no, there's nothing else like it so you know sometimes I can get bogged down in like the day-to-day -day work or stress or overwork or the fact that like oh my god I put in like 70 hours a week at my job like what am I doing I don't have social life but it doesn't matter you know when I when I turn on my computer and I see like that what I do matters so much to somebody who like th the world is so open to her you know she can go off and do anything and like the last thing that I want to do is end up being like a disappointment <laughs> you know um, so so that that really gets me out of bed in the morning um, and people are so kind and so supportive it's been great I get all teary thinking about all the people who showed up at VidCon. And plus, like, aside from that, um, I, you saw our education, uh, entertainment and education on YouTube panel this year at VidCon, and I was one woman sitting among seven men. So that's another really motivating reason for why I do that. There needs to be more positive female role models in the media who are talking about science, who are um, unafraid to share their enthusiasm and their curiosity and their incredible knowledge. Um, and so until there are equal number of us, uh, I'm definitely going to keep championing that. Do you have any advice for someone who may like to get started on YouTube, but may feel hesitant about doing so? I, it depends on like what their hesitations are. You know, what are they, what are they necessarily nervous about? Are they nervous that they don't have 
video editing experience? Are they nervous that they don't know how to talk to a camera? Are they nervous about the kind of comments or reactions they're going to get or lack thereof? It kind of, it, there are a lot of different insecurities people have when approaching online video and each one of those insecurities needs to be addressed individually. Um, and I mean, I still run into insecurities doing, doing YouTube videos. Um, I still wonder like, you know, I, I definitely take extra time to make sure my hair looks nice in, in the morning before a shoot or like I forgot we were recording this today. So I just kind of rolled out of bed. I'm wearing a t-shirt I got at Target, which is fine. But like, though, I, it's definitely like things that I have to think about. And then I like hate that I have to think about them. Like, um, especially as a woman, like my appearance is I'm staring at myself all the time. I had a photo you know, I'll have a photo shoot, and if I don't like the photos, like, I feel awful about it. That's not the focus. It's not the important thing. It's just something that I personally, like, struggle and deal with, and um, it's just kind of part of part of the deal. But uh, that it doesn't prevent me from doing what, I'm, what I want to do. You know, I, I don't let it overtake, like, my desire to continue doing videos. And I think um, if I did, that'd be kind of selfish. And like, that's not helping anybody. That's not helping us change our standards for what's acceptable for women to look like, or uh, it's not helping to change up the demographics for who is the face of a video. Um, so, you know, it's just, uh, I would just encourage people to go ahead and do it. Like, that's always my advice. My advice is just to like, turn the camera on and, and go for it. And don't worry about doing preliminary or test videos ahead of time. Don't worry about like, you know, having a, a, a secret launch series and then doing the real videos later. Just start doing videos and you will be so surprised by how much you learn from, from one to the next. It's amazing. Um, and no, you know, if you have the kind of people watching your stuff in the beginning who are going to be dismissive of you because you've done two videos and they don't like them and they don't meet their standards, look, screw those people. Those people don't matter. <laughs> those people, like, where are those people's videos? Do they have any right to judge you about the videos that you are trying to make and you're, pay like, putting in an honest effort? Like, they don't, they don't have any right. So, haters gonna hate. That's what I say. Now, in my opinion, Emily and the Brain Scoop fill a very important niche in the online education scene. Whereas most online educators are known strictly through their online presence, it's possible for viewers of the Brain Scoop to actually go on location and visit the Field Museum in person. Arguably, that's the whole idea of having a Chief Curiosity correspondent, n'est-ce pas? Beyond that, Emily touched on a very important topic, that is, women in STEM fields and women in the media. Women are drastically underrepresented in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And women are drastically underrepresented in the media. In both cases, this is because women face unique challenges that their male counterparts simply don't have to deal with. But she goes further than just recognizing that these are problems and puts herself out there in spite of any misgivings she may have, so that other girls and women know that these worlds are not closed off to them, and so that if they decide to go into the fields of STEM or into the media, they know that they won't be alone. So, tell me in the comments below or on Twitter or Tumblr or wherever, what can we all do to make the STEM fields more accessible to women? For my part, I'm doing what I can to make sure that the genders are equally represented in my interviews, because this is something that I think is very important. All right, that's all I got. Thanks for caring, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.